Dan, anyone meeting you might run away with the idea that you're an admirer of Charles Darwin. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, uh, uh, is, would that be true? Yeah. In fact, um, in my book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, I say if I could give a prize to the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin. Ahead of Newton, ahead of Einstein, ahead of everybody else. Why? Because Darwin's idea put together the two biggest worlds, the world of mechanism and material and physical causes on the one hand, the lifeless world of matter, and the world of meaning and purpose and goals. And those had seemed really just uh, un an unbridgeable gap between them, and he showed no. He showed how meanings and purposes could arise out of physical law, out of the workings of ultimately inanimate nature. And that's just a stunning unification and opens up a tremendous vista for, for, for all, all inquiries, not just for biology, but for the relationship between the second law of thermodynamics and the existence of poetry. Well, I totally agree with that. Um, on the other hand, there have been people who have said that Darwinism is a bleak, cold, ruthless view of life. I suppose in two different ways. One, one is that natural selection itself seems like a very destructive process, a lot of mm. suffering involved and so on. And the other is that precisely by uh, kicking away the, the support for the supernatural for explaining mm. things in terms of of um, supernatural designers and things that removes the support that people have felt they had for their own life for their own psychology and and, and well-being do you do you think that that this does undermine people's comfort i think it only undermines a a, a crutch that, that they don't need. And that's the crutch of an absolute, say, an immortal soul, an immaterial, immortal soul. That's an idea that a lot of people think is very important. Uh, and what it does, of course, is it replaces it with the idea of a material, mortal soul. Yeah, we have souls, but they're made of neurons. And the little neurons individually are just blind little bio-robots. They don't know, they don't care, they're just doing their jobs. The amazing thing is that if you put enough of them together in the right sort of teams, you have basically a soul. You have the, the control system and the memory of a being that can be held responsible, that can hold himself or herself responsible, that can look into the future. And because we can look into the future, because we can imagine the world in a better way, we can hold each other responsible for that in a way no other species can. Now, traditionally, the idea is God implants that soul in us. But we don't have to see it that way. We can see that the soul itself, the human soul, is itself a product of natural selection and both genetic natural selection and cultural selection. And that's why we are responsible for the future of the planet in a way no other species is. I think a lot of people have trouble getting the point that something like a soul can emerge from lots of little yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, soulless yeah. neurons. They kind of feel, well, if we've got a soul, if the whole brain has a soul, somehow each little bit of it must, must be a little bit of, a little fraction of a soul in, yeah. in, in yeah. each one. And it, it's quite a stretch, isn't it? It's not that difficult, but, but people well, do have trouble with it. In the same way, they have trouble with the idea that proteins aren't alive. Yes. <laughs> proteins are just great big macromolecules. They're not alive. How can you make a living thing out of dead stuff? Well, you can. That's the wonder of it, and that's what the scientific image shows us. You can make a living thing out of dead stuff. You can make a conscious thing out of unconscious stuff. You can make a thing with a soul out of things that don't have souls. And in every case, it's science that shows us how that's possible. It shows us how over eons, natural processes have generated the design improvements that make this all possible. 
we've been talking about uh, this at the level of the mechanism of the of the body and the brain, and so you have lots of little things building up to make one big, what appears to be one one big soul. And now you've just alluded to the same thing in historical time, mm. that uh, you start from um, very simple beginnings at the at the origin of life, and you gradually build up to the sorts of complexity that we see now in, in evolutionary time. I think you once said something about how difficult it is for people to grasp the idea of complex things being yep, made by yep. anything other than even more complex yeah, things. Yeah, in fact, I think, uh, <laughs> I think this is an idea that may be older than the species in a certain sense. It may be that uh, our a possible ancestor, Homo habilis, the handy man, the tool maker, maybe you've had some dim appreciation of the fact that it seems it always takes a big fancy thing to make a lesser thing. You never see uh, you never see a horseshoe making a making a blacksmith. You never see a pot making a potter. And what Darwin did is overthrew this. He showed how indeed a mindless, goalless, purposeless processes can over time, generate things that have purposes. Um, that's a stunning fact. And uh, I mean, that's a really stunning fact that purpose can emerge bottom up. This is, this is the, the bottom up theory of creation rather than the trickle down theory of creation. Yes. And I suppose Darwin not only showed that with respect to his own subject of, of evolution, but in a sense, he raised our consciousness to the fact that it's over and over again going to be possible to do that same trick. Indeed. In fact, they're, they're all tied together in one great tree of life. Um, we're learning every day about how the brain is itself uh, a Darwin machine, how there are evolutionary processes of development, evolutionary processes of learning, so that the way your brain is wired up now is not all just due to the genes. The genes have a, actually a rather negligible role in a great deal of the wiring. There's just too much information there. So how does it happen? It happens by processes of generation and testing and pruning and making more and trying it out and pruning it and pruning it and trying it and making more. It's an evolutionary process that goes on very fast in the brain of a, of a child and it's going on in our brains right now. Uh, and as we go up levels, we get swifter, more powerful processes of exploration. And once we've got language and human culture, we have all these mind tools. Now we can really start moving around, zipping around in this great space of possible designs. I mean, look, we've got, we've got tobacco plants that glow in the dark now because they have firefly genes spliced into their genomes. I mean, how long would it take for unaided natural selection to produce such a thing. Well, but it did, because it produced the people that produced the science, that produced the technology, that produced this. So that tobacco plant is just as natural, yeah. in a way, as, as, as any daisy. To see what a crane is, you have to know what a sky hook is, or would be if there were any. Ever since Darwin, skeptics have thought, well, there's got to be some things that are just so wonderful that you just couldn't get to them from this Darwinian beginnings. You can't get there from here, or you can't get here from there. And so they've looked for things that were irreducibly complex or just too marvelous to have been themselves the products of this inexorable grinding process of natural selection. So they've gone looking for skyhooks in the, in the, in the sense of a, of a miraculous device that just flo floats in the sky and then you can pull things up with it. There aren't any skyhooks, but there are cranes. And in fact, if you look at the history of evolution, you see that again and again, evolution has mindlessly produced a new crane which actually speeds up, makes more efficient the evolutionary process. So that we have, uh, uh, for instance, a lovely book by, by John Maynard Smith and Ursh Zathmary on the major transitions in evolution. Each one of those is a crane. Sex is a crane, multicellularity is a crane. Language is a crane, obviously. These are innovations which, once they arise, it's like shifting into a higher gear. They, evolution, the exploratory processes can go faster, can see farther, can, can be more efficient 
then the exploratory process is at a lower level. And Darwinian natural selection is the kind of model for, for cranes. It's that's that, right. It, yes. It's, and it's set up all the rest of them, probably. It's set up all the rest of them, that's right. Yeah. Unless there... I suppose there might have to be a crane in cosmology, in the, in the inflation of the universe or something like that, which is a pre-Darwinian yeah, yeah. crane. Uh, I think that the idea that, well, OK, it's, it's cranes all the way down to the origin of life, but then we have to have a skyhook at the origin. We have to have... Uh, uh, that's, a, that's an idea that some people find very attractive. Uh, I don't, because it strikes me as incoherent, uh, that uh, uh, what we have to account for is how the complexity to get clear reproduction going uh, could itself, in some sense, evolve, not by natural selection, but by an evolutionary process from something less complex. And I think that we can see, in fact, I think there are uh, an embarrassment of riches for how that early process might go. They're being sorted out now. But there is chemical evolution, and there's differences in stability so that, say, amino acids can form, as it were, spontaneously. So we've got some pretty good building blocks down there. I've always felt that cranes, in, in your sense, having the power starting from, in each case, some, some lower, almost from nothing, or so yeah. something simple, can produce the, the wonderful complexity of life and, of, as you say, of language and other things, that is itself hugely uplifting. When people say, well, where do you get your consolation yeah, from, I sort of, sort of feel, well, how much more do you want? What? Indeed. What could be more wonderful than being part of this in amazing living tapestry of, of growth and, and exploration and innovation, uh, all happening in, in not a million, not a billion, but in a trillion places at once. Uh, the the just to look just at our planet, the exuberance of the l life processes going on around us and all of the creativity that is there. It's just great to be alive in this with this tremendous exuberance of exploration and processes of life all around us. And those very same processes have given rise to our brains which are capable of understanding the very phenomena that we're, that we're talking about. So the, uh, we, we have the added wonder that not only are we a part of it, not only are we a part of this, of this evolutionary process, but we are able to understand it using brains that have been given to us by this very same process. So when people say something like, oh, you've taken away my consolation, I, I feel like saying, well, how much more do you want? How, what could be more wonderful than to find yourself on this planet, by the way, against incredible odds of statistically yeah. that, we, that we, we exist, that we find ourselves here. We find ourselves not only able to appreciate what's going on around us, but also able to appreciate the fact that we appreciate it and where we get it from. You know, sometimes I like to say um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the planet has, has grown a nervous system and it's yes. us. And for the first time in, in, in five plus billion years, uh, if the planet is endangered by, say, an asteroid, it's possible that it, the planet, can take some action against it. We, we, have, we are actually capable now of looking far enough into the future so that we may be able, we, no other species, we might be able to save the planet from a catastrophe, for yes. instance. The planet has grown a nervous system in the sense that we are each individual neurons of some huger, huger nervous system, yeah. perhaps. And maybe now it's even starting to... We're starting to get the beginnings of a, of a realization that those separate nervous systems are kind of coalescing and making a larger system, so civilization, uh, the internet, uh, world literature, that kind of thing. Yes, and of course it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be smooth or going to be reverses. There have been lots of reverses in the past, but, but, but I think in general this is a, is a great reason to believe in progress because of the, the connectivity that we now have. Uh, 
people around the world can contribute to this process in a way they never could before. If you think back just a, just a hundred years, the tremendous isolation of people from each other, and I think most of the chaos and turmoil and violence that we see in the world today ultimately has its explanation in the fact that never before have people been so flooded with information about each other and uh, uh, we're, 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 we're drowning in uh, information about, about the planet and we haven't accommodated it all yet and that's there's a lot of growing pains, yeah. but we're getting there. And the growing pains show themselves in things like mental illness and, and things, I suppose. But in a way, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable how good we are at coping with it. I mean, when you think how radically different our environment is from the one in which yeah. we were naturally selected yeah. for most of our, our history, we're not doing a bad job. And I think that's not because of our uh, genetically given, our God-given brains. It's because of our culture-given minds, um, which is uh, designed by cultural processes. And it uses the brain, it, it's, it, it molds the brain, it shapes the brain, it gives the brain its, its, its software, its functional structure. And that has grown apace, we'll think just the last several thousand years. Uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle, didn't have brains that were importantly different from anybody's today. And they were really smart fellows. But look what they didn't have. Look at all the thinking mm -hmm. tools they didn't mm -hmm. have. Uh, any high school kid can now have thinking tools at her disposal that were unimagined by, by the smartest people in the world a couple of thousand years ago. That, too, has an evolutionary history. Yes. People often use the phrase cultural evolution as though it was the same process. There's clearly some kind of an analogy there, but do you think there's a bit more than just an analogy? I think there is a, a, a more than an analogy, because I think we can see at least some very deep parallels. Uh, Darwin begins the origin, as you well know, with, with a, a three-way comparison. He compares uh, uh, artificial selection, methodical selection, he calls it, and then he talks about unconscious selection, which is where human beings, without knowing what they were doing or even trying to do it, were, were domesticating uh, plants and animals. And then there's natural selection where no human intervention at all. And I think we see the same thing with culture. I think we see, for instance, languages have evolved, but they're not invented, they're not, very few words are coined. Uh, uh, so words are are human creations, but who made them? Uh, no individual. They, nobody tried to make them, they just arose. Um, music, uh, the, the form of music, the, the shapes of music, arose without any inventors, without any, any uh, people laying down the law. Later, later, you get composers and uh, poets and people making artifacts that they're really designing and thinking about, but all of this has to rest on a process of differential re replication. Uh, um, languages go extinct, words jump from language to language, musical ideas persist and change and get mutated over hundreds or thousands of years, and the culture that we're now living and breathing every day is a product of many processes, only a few of which are the uh, deliberate design processes of foresighted designers. Yes. One difference occurs to me is that in <clears throat> biological evolution, at least on this planet, we seem to have almost nothing but divergence. Once, once a species are split apart into two yeah. daughter species, they don't merge again, whereas languages presumably do. I mean, Dutch and German are clearly descended from the same yeah. com common ancestor, and they're, they're, they're very similar. Uh, but there's no reason why words can't be borrowed across, and of course, they don't. I mean, English is a, is a notorious example of a. Yeah, of in a, fact, of a in fact I, think, I think that's a good reason for uh, uh, 
putting a little more emphasis on the evolution of words rather than on languages, because words jump very promiscuously from language to language, but we can still track them. Uh, and it is, uh, it, it is very much like horizontal gene transfer, which uh, yeah. is, is, is rare, but does occur. And in fact, if you look back it's at the earliest, bacteria. if yes. you go back and look at the earliest days of life, as you know, in yeah. the, uh, 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 the, the tree doesn't look like a branching tree right. at all. That's it looks right. like a great mixed up bush with gene transfer happening all over the place. And I think in a way, human culture is, is sort of continuously in that state where there's tremendous horizontal transfer that's possible. It's like bacterial evolution rather yeah, than, yeah. rather than, right. uh, yes. Who knows whether it will move on. But. Yes, it might not have to. Yeah. Dan, I know that you had a fairly recent brush with mortality and um, was an anxious moment for all your many friends, I can tell you, uh, and, and came out of it with, with some splendid thoughts. Well, Yes, uh, my aorta burst, but fortunately I got wonderful care now. I have an artificial uh, aorta. And a lot of people wondered if this was going to change my mind about, about whether or not I believed in God or believed in an afterlife, and absolutely not. But I did, I did have a, 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 an epiphany of sorts. I realized that, first of all, I was, of course, tremendously relieved to be alive, and and very much buoyed up by all the affection and support I got from family and friends all over. Uh, and I realized that when I said, thank goodness, I didn't just mean that as a euphemism for thank God. I really meant thank goodness. The reason that I was still alive was because of all the goodness, technological goodness, medical goodness, just good-hearted people, really wonderful, caring, lo lovely people. and. All of that had, was what saved my life, and I was very grateful. And then I realized what I can do with that gratitude is pay it back. I can try to create some more goodness. I can add to the supply of goodness in the world. We don't need a middleman. Why, why? Yes, I love that phrase, we don't need a middleman. That, that's... Why thank God? Why not yes. thank God's creatures? Why not yes. thank the doctors? Why yes. not thank the nurses? Yes. Why not thank the, the, the medical journals that, that peer reviewed the, the, the technologies that, that were so beautifully honed so that they could save my life? There's a lot of goodness in the world, and I'm very glad there is. I wouldn't be here if they weren't, and now I can try to do my share to add a little goodness directly back into it. So don't bother praying, go plant a tree, go yes. teach somebody well, I was something. was particularly impressed in that I read, I read the, the written thing that you, that you, yeah. you, you wrote yeah. on your, on your re recovery bed. And of course I was moved by your tributes to the nurses and people who actually cared for you, but the, the, the one thing that might not, not have occurred to people was that you also thanked the as you say, the scientific journals in which the results were published, the peer review process, yeah. the the uh, the Nobel Prize winner who'd invented the CT scanner, which which uh, it was a sort of the whole scientific enterprise, which is a a marvelous example of collective human yeah. cooperation worldwide, international. It yeah. transcends boundaries, languages. Yeah. It was a beautiful tribute to all that's best in humanity. Was what I felt about your uh, that thing you wrote and and. I think we can be so proud of what our species with its different cultures has produced and we can have a tremendous loyalty to it. I think that's what we want to preserve. That's what we want to send into the future. We want to add to that. We want to improve it. It's got flaws. It's got problems. Let's fix them. Let's make the world better for our children and our grandchildren. The, the vision of purpose that comes out of this is just as inspiring. In fact, I think it's more inspiring. I am, I am more inspired by the idea that I am a living, grateful part of this great fabric of cr creation and, and exploration that is the evolutionary process. That's more inspiring to me than the idea that I'm, I am a, a, a something 
a doll made by God oh, to, no to, contest, to, yeah. to, to pray to, yes. uh, to pray to him. What? That is so demeaning of our I think it is. Yes, I think yeah. it is, yeah. Um, other examples of this, I, I think the, the Human Genome Project, uh, the space exploration enterprise, these are superb examples of what humanity can do when it gets together collectively yep. with a collective purpose, a collective will, cooperation. At the same time, we have to remember that that same collective purpose has been used appallingly to, oh. to um, ferment wars, to build armaments, to build, to build mass weapons, hydrogen bombs and, and things. It, it is double-edged and, and one of the things I suppose we have to do is uh, use our collective wisdom to deploy the scientific skills in the right direction. And I think we have to, we have to recognize that the current democratization of information created by the internet and the web and cell phones and the like uh, creates a sort of chaotic condition where we, we can't control information the way we used to think we could. And so we'd better start thinking if you like epidemiologically about this, we've got to recognize that these ideas are going to spread all over the world, and the effects of the ideas may not always be uh, what we want. So we have to we have to start thinking of the sort of environmental impact of our own ideas, and how to how to uh, help people for whom these ideas are very threatening, help them help them overcome their fear and see why these are, this is the right way to look at the world, not the wrong way. I like your thought of thinking epidemiologically and um, thinking back to what we were talking about, uh, languages being more like bacterial evolution and indeed culture generally being more like bacterial evolution where information is exchanged freely rather than being mm. wholly divergent. I suppose there has been a time in history when cultural evolution has been more or less watertight in different countries, I mean, Islamic civilization, Christian civilization, not much interchange between them, a bit more like ordinary biological species that don't exchange information. Mm -hmm. Now we seem to be reverting to a more bacterial stage where we're epidemiologically swapping information, where the internet is doing that. I find that rather a cheerful thought, that we're, that we're no longer in these isolated, diverging yeah. cultures yeah, yeah. which are potentially enemies of each other, the cross-fertilization that we can now get could actually be a very good sign, couldn't it? I think it can. I, th I think <laughs> we better hope it is because we're not going to stop that. And in fact, I think that's one of the main problems in the world. Uh, leaders uh, uh, in societies with traditional cultures have never had to deal with the fact that, that they, they couldn't uh, uh, they never had to deal with the fact that they're, that they're, the people that, uh, that they were leading uh, uh, had access to information because they just didn't. Yes. And now I think every traditional society is facing what is really a very scary prospect. Just as we would if, if we were invaded by outer space aliens and they had a technologically very advanced culture and they also had uh, uh, a popular culture that was very alien to us and somewhat threatening, and we saw our children just lapping it up. Oh, the, we'd feel very anxious and worried. We'd be afraid that, oh my gosh, everything that, everything that we hold dear is, 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 going to, is going to go extinct. And a lot of it is going to go extinct. Languages are going extinct at a great rate. Which is and, sad. And, and, and whole cultures are, are going extinct. So we shouldn't... Uh, minimize the pain, we should appreciate that this is a painful process. At the same time, we treat each other as rational, knowledgeable people, and people make informed choices, and we have to honor that. And if, and if the natives want to use outboard motors, well, why not? It's a very good idea. Is it going to change their culture? Oh, yeah, it's going to change their culture tremendously in ways that we may regret and that they may regret. Before you leave, by the way, I want to show you a, 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 a stunning little bit of film that Homer Groening, the father of, Homer, of Matt Groening, who did The Simpsons, oh, yeah, yeah. 
It's, it's, I, I show it to you. It's just beautiful. It's my, it's it, my, that's where Homer comes from, is it? It's, yeah. Okay. It's, my, it's my sort of atheist hymn now. Okay, it's fantastic. Yeah. Dan, it's lovely to see you looking so fit and obviously pulled through so marvellously from your, your um, operation. But there's, come a, there's going to come a time when we don't pull through. Yeah, and, what about that? Uh, what about that? Um, do we get consolation from science, from Darwin, from what? Well, I guess we do. Uh, a, a dear professor of mine just died just a few days ago, and I've been thinking quite a bit about it. And uh, the idea that he lives for eternity in heaven doesn't give me any consolation at all. The idea that his memory lives on with his children and his friends and his colleagues. And of course, he has his work, or he had his work. Uh, which which will live on. Not everybody gets that kind of legacy, and I think that for those that we love that, that die young or without that sort of issue, uh, the best consolation is just that they had a chance. They they got to be on this stupendous planet and live for a while, and they may have suffered. And I think seeing our suffering in the guise of the, the whole cosmos can make it seem not quite so earth-shatteringly special. Uh, yeah, we suffer, but... Uh, You're right, it's, it, it is a consolation to have a few books behind one, or musical compositions or whatever. Or, I, I suppose, a great family life, and, and, and there, are, there are plenty of things hmm. uh, of that sort. I, I'm rather moved by the astounding improbability of my own existence. The, the, when you think about the odds ag against our coming into, into existence, it is a huge privilege to be here. And I sort of feel that you want to say that when people say they're bored, you, well, you, you have no business to be bored. You, 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 you exist. Um, there are gazillions of people who could have existed in your place and many of them would have been a lot better than you. Um, so stop whinging. Uh, and the same thing when, when people bemoan their lot, or indeed bemoan the fact that life is going to come to an end. You're lucky to have had anything at all, is what I feel like, like saying to them. Uh, stop moaning. Exactly. Uh, uh, and we're not filled with fear and trembling at the thought that there were all those years before we were alive. So it shouldn't bother us that there are going to be all those years when we're not alive. Mark, uh, Mark Twain, I think, yeah. said, um, I, I was dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and never suffered the slightest inconvenience. Yeah, right, sure. Of course, I wouldn't dream of saying stop whinging when somebody had just lost, lost a loved one. If you, you've just lost your, your professor. There's something immensely precious about human friendship and, and uh, human closeness. And to lose somebody can be like losing a limb. And so that very much doesn't come under my heading of, of stop whinging. Of course, you, you give thanks to what? You thank goodness uh, for, for what they were and what they did and what they achieved and what they were to you. But of course, you mourn them, you weep, you, um, you wish they were still here. But you get on with life, you, you face life, and you, and you get on without them. You know, I think. Gratitude is one of the wonderful human emotions and one of the great springs of, I think, a belief in God. You get up and you look around and you say, I'm so lucky to be alive. And this you is want so to be grateful. I, want to thank I wish there was somebody I could thank. thank. Yes, exactly. And there's nobody to thank. Yes. And so you have to thank your lucky stars, and then you can think, well, at least I can make more reason for people to other people to be thankful yes. and that i think okay. is the is that That's, i think yeah. is the is the 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 most positive response yes. to the fact that there's there's nobody to accept our our thanks i think we can do even better than that we can say that that given that there's nobody to thank being able to reflect upon the process that gave rise to you is the nearest we can come to thanking. And it's actually rather better than thanking because it's a thoughtful thing to do. It's an understanding, a comprehending thing to do. So you're not just kind of thanking your sky daddy. You're, you're marveling in the fact that you are here and 
the process that gave rise to you is the same process that gave rise to all these trees and the and the and the, and the earth. And it's no accident that we are surrounded mm. by uh, by an entire ecosystem. We couldn't exist without it. Thanking something it can be sublimated into understanding how it all happened. And I think you get the same sort of comfort from that. Not, not just comfort, I think awe. I yes, think, exaltation. I think, I th exactly, I think, yes. uh, hallelujah. Exactly. <laughs> it's yes. just st spectacular, it's so wonderful. And that, that sense of exaltation is, if anything, I think stronger in me because of my atheism than it would be if I if I were a believer. Yes. I I see uh, the the universe itself as a thing which is not quite what Anselm said God was, a being greater than which nothing can be conceived. But certainly I can't think of anything greater yeah. than the universe. It's 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 fantastic. Yes, hallelujah for the universe and for the fact that we can understand it, or, yes. we, or we're working yes. on understanding yeah. it. Well, yeah. Richard, Good. can we talk once more about um, how you'd find, just once more, from, from your, your feelings on, you know, somebody who has a series of life, how you find in science and in Darwin, in the sense that I was lucky to be alive and to have a chance to appreciate all, all this. I thought he just said it. Well, I, I know, but just, you, okay, uh, just, just, yeah. just, just once more would be, yeah. would be terrific. Um, <coughs> because what you, what, the, when you were just talking then about the constellation, it was more about sort of getting on with your life and saying, you know, you know, um, you know how the it is. Oh, you want me to say that again? Yes, yeah. but, but why again, though? Oh. Technical reasons. Yes. yes. <laughs> so you're hiding behind that anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> and how you take it, you know, how you, you would deal personally with great loss or, or you'd help somebody else deal with great loss in that way. Which I think would be a good way, doesn't it? Do you? I, yeah, yeah, I do. I um, really do, actually. I mean, I, I think when you're actually mourning a, a loved one, I'm not sure that it... Well, I think, you know, I think later, yeah, try, 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 try something like this. I mean, uh, the, 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 very, the very fact of your mourning shows the value yeah, of what's lost. Yeah, that's good. Well, I can say, I mean, mortality is an, is an essential part of natural selection. But, um, okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to cut that bit anyway, I think. Okay, that's... I'm saying, okay. Besides, the, the, the Americans okay. wouldn't okay. understand. You, if, if you had suffered a great loss or someone else, had, uh, you had mm -hmm. suffered a loss and they were grieving, there is, of course, they're still going to mourn, but there is a, you know, it's something mm -hmm. they can take from our knowledge of science, I how long the knowledge that Darwin has given us about whatever it is about it's to live, blower, each and every one of us mm -hmm. was to live for a little bit or to, in our lives to, to know that we could understand the great world we live or something like that. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do, but I think, I think we've, we've done it better with the hallelujahs. We, we, we... Please. Um, can we have it and then later on we can see which one kind of works and we'll use the best bits of everything. Okay. Um, just going to wait for a little while. Yeah. This buzz. <coughs> Our own mortality is in a way no worse than, as you said, uh, what it was like before we were born, or having a anaesthetic. I mean, you might say, you know, Dying is not going to be great, so why don't we just have a general anaesthetic and, and stop when we're, when we're ready for it? However, when we're bereaved, when we lose a loved one, when we lose somebody who's really close, somebody who's been part of our life, that's terrible. There's no other way around it. It's, it, it can be like losing a limb. And uh, we have to get what comfort we can, and we can get it from remembering them, uh, looking at their favorite poems, listening to their favorite music, things like that. I think there is comfort to be had from the thought that we're all part of the evolutionary process. It is a process of successive deaths over countless generations that, has, uh, that is natural selection and has given rise to, to, the, to the way we are. 
we have plenty of time to anticipate it. Nothing will ever bring back the lost person, and I can imagine sort of howling with despair at the loss of somebody that I really love. But nevertheless, the the buoying up effect of of the the reflection that that we are lucky, they were lucky mm -hmm. to have come into existence. If they're the sort of person um, we we want to know, they they will have left the world a better place. Anyway, we can give thanks again for them. I mean, give thanks to them uh, for what they did. Our, our grief is an, is an effect, a measure of how wonderful they were. Exactly. And exactly. we you can't have you can't have the one without, without the other. The other no. And uh, I think that reflection is always available. You think. The, 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 I feel so terrible now. I'm, I'm just, as you say, howling with, with despair. That's, that's how wonderful they this were. life was. Yes. That's how wonderful this is. Yes. Uh, and that's yeah. a thought. Mm. That's, what, that's, that's wonderful, um, but it, it, it's also the sort of thing you can't, you know, you can't say in it's conversation. Be spontaneous. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> we are alone among animals in foreseeing our end, but also alone among animals in being able to say before we die, yes, this is why it was worth being born in the first place. It's not just that our improbability makes us thankful to be here because we are so improbable. We're also privileged not just to be here, we're privileged to belong to the human species because the human species really is rather unique. Among all animals, we are alone in knowing that we've got to die, and that's no fun, I suppose, to know to, to, to know the, to be able to foretell your end. But we're also unique in knowing why it was worth being born, coming into existence in the first place. And why is that? Why are we unique? Oh, why, 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 when you say we know no. why it was worth, worth it in the first place? No. Well, well, why? Uh, okay, but I mean that—that's all that yeah. hallelujah stuff again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want me to repeat it? <laughs> but if it's sure, but if, okay. if it, uh, it's absolutely uh, about you know our knowledge, our knowledge of how one, our science, what science okay. has given us, and that's mm. okay. You know. Um, so shall I start that bit again then? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Um, so if you could take it from yeah. dealing with grief and loss. <coughs> Of course it's hard dealing with grief and dealing with loss. There is some consolation to be had in the reflection of how privileged we are to be here at all. Statistically, we're so unlikely to exist. It's astonishingly mm. unlikely that you and I exist, and yet, yet we do. That's a privilege. But also we're privileged to belong to the human species, because the human species is unique in all sorts of ways. It's unique in knowing that our life is going to end, but we're also unique in knowing why it was worth coming into existence in the first place. Here we are, we find ourselves on this planet. It's like coming awake after a, an anaesthetic. You, you open your eyes and you say, where am I? And, you, and you, f you gradually learn where you are and you understand it. Because we're human and because we're scientists, we, we not only see where we are, we understand why we're here and we owe it to our human history, the history of ideas, the history of philosophers, the history of scientists, perhaps in my case, above all, Darwin. We now understand what it is that has brought us here. And that is a wonderful thought that is, goes a long way to removing the grief and the fear that as humans we inevitably also experience. Well, I didn't know that they wanted me to say anything more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I thought that was it. That, well, well, I thought, <laughs> Richard, I like, I like what, you, uh, what you said at the end of Unweaving the Rainbow. And uh, that is the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can get outside the universe 
I mean in the sense of putting a model of the universe inside our skulls, not a superstitious, small-minded, parochial model filled with spirits and hobgoblins, astrology and magic, glittering with fake crocks of gold where the rainbow ends. A big model, worthy of the reality that regulates, updates and tempers it. A model of stars and great distances, where Einstein's noble space-time curve upstages the curve of Yahweh's covenantal bow and cuts it down to size. A powerful model, incorporating the past, steering us through the present, capable of running far ahead to offer detailed constructions of alternative futures and allow us to choose. Peter and Jean Medowa, in one of their books, said, Only human beings guide their behavior by a knowledge of what happened before they were born and a preconception of what may happen after they are dead. Thus, only humans find their way by a light that illuminates more than the patch of ground they stand on. The spotlight passes, but exhilaratingly before doing so, it gives us time to comprehend something of this place in which we fleetingly find ourselves and the reason that we do so. We are alone among animals in foreseeing our end. We are also alone among animals in being able to say before we die, yes, this is why it was worth coming to life in the first place. Now, more than ever, seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. John Keats. A Keats and a Newton, listening to each other, might hear the galaxies sing. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. that's, that's the end of my book, Unweaving the Rainbow, which I wrote in 1998, which was a kind of attempt to convey the poetry of science. The title comes from Keats, who complained that Newton, by explaining the rainbow, by unweaving the rainbow, had removed all the poetry. And really, the point of the book is, to, is that exact opposite is the case. Uh, I, th I think that's beautiful, Richard. In fact, I think we should probably try to gather more such wonderful passages together uh, and treat them as uh, part of the literature of, of science, of humanism, of, of, of the Enlightenment, and make them more available to people. Actually, that's a yeah. wonderful idea. I mean, things like uh, Carl Sagan, exactly. uh, Peter yes, Atkins. Yes. Um, right. We could get... That would be a really nice sort of a, an anthology of no. scientific... Hymns to the universe. There's your title. Yes. <laughs> yes. The universe is so wonderful on its own, it doesn't need a boss, it doesn't need a, a, a creator. The fact that it can, in effect, create itself is wonderful enough. I, and. I can sometimes even get in a frame of mind where I think, well, probably in some dim way, that's what the human beings who, who've been worshiping God have, have been up to all along. They've, they've, they've felt the gratitude, they've felt the wonder, and they've thought, well, uh, who do I thank? Um, who do I sing hymns to? But the, the uh, thought that you've just uh, had couldn't have, I mean, it had to wait until science came along to give us the understanding. I it think would, so. It wouldn't have worked if they said, oh, well, I expect an explanation will come along someday. Uh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, there has yeah, to actually yeah, be yeah. the explanation, yeah. or at least the beginnings of it. We haven't finished yet, of course. There's a long way to go. But it's reached the stage now where, where we, are, we, can, we can actually yeah. grow out yeah. of, the, of the earlier kind of thanksgiving and, uh, and move on. Uh, many years ago, I was... Uh, about to replant a, a hayfield, and my neighbor said, "Well, Dan, you should uh, you should plant oats as a nurse crop, along with the timothy." So, what, what's that? He said, "Well, a nurse crop like oats, it, it comes up first, and it's hardier, and it, it keeps the weeds down, and it protects the hay, the timothy, when it comes up. And once it's once it's up, you can you can harvest the oats. You can do what you want with them, make oat hay, or so and, and religion was the nurse crop. Religion was the nurse crop yeah. for science. Yes." And, and I think it's very possible that we would never have had science if we didn't have the, the sort of religious era first. And we can be, we can be grateful for those oats. Yeah. Um, nice and, point. and now we've got science. And yeah. it's not clear that we need to plant any more oats. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>